na 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 da da na ba ba da ba. Whoa! Look at that popcorn. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Truth and Movies. Today we're breaking down the movie Beetlejuice. Classic. This is going to be a fun time for all of us. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right into the movie. If, if you're just joining us, you're going to watch this movie with us, and we're going to check out and look for the symbolism that's in the movie. What is the movie? saying on a deeper level, right? So let's jump right into the movie and watch it together. Let's check it out. This movie's about Beetlejuice. Classic movie starts off with the company that brought you the film. And their logo is represented by the letter G. So that letter G typically is often seen uh, used by Freemasons, the Illuminati, etc. And it's a, it's an indicator in the old language um, back when it was just a picture and it indicated a destination, a place to get to, a place to go to. Um, it was also the picture of a bent foot in the old times. This movie is a Tim Burton film. Tim Burton's done a lot of some of my favorite movies out there, but let's check out his name real quick. What does Tim Burton mean, right? Uh, Tim comes from Time or time, you could say, which in, uh, which in ancient Greek meant honor. So Tim or Time means to honor. And then Burr, if we look at Burr, basically comes from the Proto-Indo-European word Bars, which means a bristle. So if we check out bristle, it takes us to Bars, which means a point, a bristle, or if you check out right here, it means a spike, right? So basically a beam, a column, a point, a spike, etc. right? So honor, spike, or... um. Honor, spike, column, etc., beam, etc. And then the end, ton, bur ton. Ton, it says, is often used as a shortened version of town. So together, Tim Burton's entire name is a word picture that conveys an idea or a sense of uh, an honorable one from the town of the spike or the town of the beam or beam town. Um, it could also mean to honor that particular region or that particular place. So we start things off and it shows us uh, a town. We're looking down on a town. This could be your average town or whatnot. And the focus of this town really is the church down there in the center. As you can see, it's got a beam or a spike or a point right at the top of it. We call those steeples. I'm going to come back to that particular architecture style in just a bit whenever we see the rest of the uh, houses and stuff. Uh, Winona Ryder is in this movie too. Let's break down her name since we did Tim Burton. Uh, Winona comes from the Dakota language and it means firstborn daughter or a female who is firstborn. So we, now we have this firstborn attribute or symbolism and ride or rider just means a person who does ride, which means to be carried on as in horseback to move forward, to rock, to float. That's an interesting one, right? Uh, so firstborn of the floaters, firstborn of the riders also reminds me of riders on the storm. Of course, that is an indicator of those who survive the apocalypse or those who enter in from another world during the depressurization of our world whenever we go through that polarity shift. All right, cool. So here is the steeple with the church and a graveyard right across the street. It looks like a real place, but this is actually just a tiny little model. They're showing us the microscopic scale. So it helps me out when I watch these movies to think of the symbolism in terms of scale. Are they representing something that is on the mesocosm, which is what we're normally used to, the macrocosm, which is much bigger and greater, usually above us descending downwards, or the microcosm, which is usually seen as like the microverse. Ant-Man is a good, uh, good example for like the microverse. And you see the steeple on top too. Many people may have wondered, what is a steeple even for? What is it good for? You may have gone to church and asked some people. And I've asked hundreds of people just to see if they knew or even had an idea or something. Why, why is there a, che a steeple on the church? It's because it's, a, it's basically a gigantic lightning rod, right? So you'll often see this type of architecture during the times whenever our atmosphere was more energetically charged and there was electricity abundant all over the place. The ether was much lower down to the ground and people would put these lightning rods or make their, their structure of um, their buildings more pointed, lots of points and spires and rods and beams and stuff. And that was in order to keep the, the massive thunderbolts of the gods from coming down and destroying that particular area. Now we go to uh, the main character's house on this model. This is not a real city, it's just a model of one, but it looks like one, right? 
And you can see this house is on a hill. It's a huge house at the very top of a hill on this city. Symbolically speaking, this represents Mount Maru at the middle of the world, as we've talked about many times. The White House almost always represents our world on the microcosmic scale, symbolically speaking, right? Um, whenever we see the White House, basically it represents our entire world because the outside of the house is white. Um, that's because our covering for our world or the sky is... Um, traditionally seen to be like an ice, a solid ice kind of a color or a white color, typically. Um, also, this is what it looks like f looking down onto these various worlds in the fractal verse. Uh, if you're on the outside, you would see white domes or some, I mean, it could look like a crater depending on your viewpoint, but you would see white from the outside. On the inside, it's a dark city. On the inside, it's uh, it's a covering. So you just see the blackness. So that's the black and white symbolism, which is going to come up in this movie too. Also, on the very top of this house, you see a spider. See that spider right there that's about to crawl up or crawl over the house right there? That represents a grandmother spider. That represents the plasma that is uh, sitting on the roof of our world right now. There's there's uh, what they call in academics the plasma sphere, which is on the roof of our world, swirling about. And the only thing that's keeping that out is an electromagnetic force. It's magnetism generated by our world itself. Whenever our world goes through a neutral point and then our polarity shift, that magnetic field goes down, allowing that plasma to come on in, in the form of spiders and other serpentine types of symbols. All right, so one of the main characters, he grabs the spider off of the model and he takes it over to his window where you can see the actual real place, right? So here was the... Uh, Here's a little church or whatever in the model. And then they he took the spider off and then he like throws it right at the exact same place where it basically just was in the movie. This is funny to me just because they're like three, four stories up or something. He just casually tosses it like he's saving it. Um, but that's really interesting too, how far objects or specifically insects and animals and stuff, the smaller they are, it seems like they can fall further without being hurt. You know what I mean? Um, which we'll talk more about whenever we go back into gigantism and how falling was a huge danger to the giants because they're so big. All right. Now we meet our two protagonists. Uh, these are the lovebirds who are on vacation in this town and they're sort of, you know, spicing up the place or whatever. You can see the models in the background over there. And if you take a look, you can actually see their house on the top of this huge hill. This is the original house on Haunted Hill, basically. Let's see if I can get in there close enough. It's really hard. I can't really do it. Uh, but the model's up on this huge hill. There's This is their house right here, the White House, as you can see up on the hill. And it's up on top of that hill because it represents Mount Maru, basically. All right, now, they go out to get something, and they have to cross this red-covered bridge. Do you see there's a little dog back there? There's a little puppy. See him right there, that little puppy dog? So this puppy dog is going into the red bridge and they're going to like swerve off to the side to try to avoid hitting this dog and they crash right into this red bridge. This bridge symbolically and every bridge in the movies is, is a, a place of crossing. It's a place of transition. That's why they have to die on this bridge right here. It's a, it's a place where you cross over from one realm or one reality to another. It could be from the living a uh, physical world to the spiritual world, or it can be from a physical world to another physical world, to another realm, another place of existence altogether. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, and then specifically, this whole red part was a prop that they put over this bridge. They wanted the bridge to be red. It had to be symbolized by that red color, which represents uh, the red plasma that swirls around our over our world too. All right, so they they crash through the bridge, they fall down, I think it's interesting that they have a yellow car too. Now I took a look at this car and let me zoom in on this, uh, on this bumper sticker that they have, if we can read it, it's really hard to make out, but it says it's upside down and it says, I break for animals. And sure enough, they did break for animals. This guy right here, who's totally fine. They, they crashed over and, uh, died basically. So they're instantly transported back to the front door of their own house. And they've got memory problems trying to figure out what happened. How did they get back home and stuff? But the first thing it shows you is this cuckoo clock, which is really interesting that they chose to zoom in. When they zoom in on stuff in the movies, I'm paying attention to what it is because it means they want your mind to remember this, symbolically speaking. Uh, the cuckoo, we'll just go over this real quick because we've talked about the cuckoo and the chicken symbolism and stuff uh, time and time again, and how that represents um, the sound, cuckoo 
or cha cha or ha ha. It's a uh, it's all kind of a uh, stems from a guttural ancient sound, and it represents this, the ancient letter het, which is where we get our 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 description for the number eight, because het was actually the eighth number in the alphabet or in the alphabet. Um, as you can see, the number eight looks kind of like in in this side over here. It kind of looks like a ladder or something, but over time that number actually flipped around. So if you take a look at the ancient version, it looks like a Roman numeral three or something with these three beams shooting up. Uh, there's a, a ground level and there's a sky level with three beams shooting up to the top. And then over time it started changing. Look at the Egyptian version of this symbol. This symbol, the het, which is represented by the number eight, and then specifically two of them together makes the kaka sound or the checha sound, right? Um, which also gives us the number 88. And it's the 88 symbolism that represents time travelers or space travelers or people who are going from one reality to another reality, right? Uh, in, in ancient Egyptian, they actually drew it in a, a more true to form way, which is this way right here. And as you can see, it kind of looks like a, a double helix or a DNA strand or something. That's because this represents a boundary, a marker, specifically a boundary that is outside on the earth, an earth boundary. Uh, it's called chet. You can also say chet as well. And it means a fence or a border or a boundary, specifically one that is outside. It can imply a wall and things like that. But what the reason why this is uh, important is because up there towards the lands at the North Pole, they saw these sky beams that were plasma basically swirling up into the sky. And those were the, the pillars of Hercules. Those were the markers. Those were the boundaries um, that separated some other type of realm, some other worldly place to the to the mesocosm where we live, the place where we're used to living, right? Um, so oftentimes the people, the animals, etc., that were um, that came from those lands were seen as strange and weird and different. So oftentimes they gave them that name, keke or cuckoo or coco or or very similar things like that, right? Um, all right, so we go back into the house. The fireplace is not lit, and then all of a sudden, fire just appears out of nowhere, right? <clears throat> now we're talking about Mount Maru and stuff, and we're going to see some plasma apocalypse symbolism in this movie as well. Um, the gases are released up out of the earth whenever we go through these apocalyptic events. And because the air is electromagnetically charged, many of those gases catch fire. Even if for a few moments, they just have spurts of fire that come up out of the ground. Now they come back into the house and Barbara, which is the girl, the wife, um, she's sort of being sarcastic and she's like man a perfect way to start our vacation right is jumping off of a bridge on accident and he says well you'll feel better when you're dry honey now this is us this is us symbolically as we go through the apocalypse those who survive basically and we make it onto the other side we get a vacation we get a vacation from the system this crazy upside down world that we live in and that is the year of jubilee where all of the slaves are set free you will gain your independence and your true freedom and have to figure out what you really want to live for when you're no longer living in a system that insists that you, you know, run around in circles, chasing your tail, going into these loops every day. As a matter of fact, there's a song that plays during this movie that's about that. Now she says that fire wasn't burning when we left. Symbolically, when they left, it was leaving the old world behind, right? There are also ghosts in the movie, okay? So there's multiple levels of symbolism that are happening. Um, but when they left the old world behind before they transitioned through that red bridge, um, there was no fire burning in the house. Now there is a fire in the house. The fire in the house symbolizes Mount Maru and the fire that is inside of that or the pyre amid the pyramid right? Um, whenever that blue beam energy shoots upward, that is like the chimney of the world and the chimney is seen as being lit. The fireplace is seen as being lit. Um, and whenever it's not there, when that energy retracts and it's gone, the world suffers through famines and sicknesses and entropy is introduced into our world and the life force is actually seeps out of our world for a time as it retracts back down into the earth. All right, so they go to warm their hands by the fire. They're kind of cold and all of a sudden this Flame, just like we talked about, exactly like in the Princess Bride, um, whenever you, they, went, they went through that uh, magic forest or whatever, where they got the, the flames shooting up out of the ground and stuff. And she actually catches on fire, but she doesn't feel it or anything. They're trying to imply that that's just because she's a ghost, right? I believe that, but we should, 
I enjoy getting deeper than that. I enjoy figuring out how these things physically could happen instead of acknowledging that that's just what happens to ghosts or whatever, um, to, to really take a deep dive and figure out how that could physically work. How could that be possible if we have something like this? Uh, one reason is because of the nitrous oxide influx. Um, there's going to be various elements that are created or recreated uh, by the plasma itself which I'm going to show you some sweet examples during this presentation of the types of things that plasma can do to restructure uh, the physical world and change things into other things, right? Anyways, um, so yeah, the nitrous oxide clouds can keep you from feeling pain and stuff like that too. It's also said that um, these are attributes that the Anunnaki or the killer clowns from outer space or the fallen ones, the Nephilim, etc., that they had this sort of attribute where they their their pain threshold seems to have been much higher almost to the point where they couldn't feel or they couldn't feel pain. Could because of that too. All right. He says, uh, come on. So they're starting to walk away and the wife, Barbara, says, come on, I'll make some coffee. I took a picture of this just because like it's another reference in the movies to just a subtle, hey, drink coffee. They don't care if it's Folgers, if it's Colombian, if it's any kind of coffee, like, you know what I mean? It's just like milk. They just put coffee in these movies and they almost make it look like you should be drinking coffee. Why do they want us to drink so much coffee? That's just my question to ask in general. So he's walking around. He's like, do you remember how we even got back up here? So now after they went through this cataclysmic event or dying, right? Now they're having memory problems. They can't remember how they got back home, right? Um, There is... Memory is an interesting topic, and I've done many videos about memory and how fragile our memory is, especially when we go through traumatic events, especially the most traumatic event of all, um, death, which is why our memories seem to be re-wiped out whenever we go through um, reincarnation and whatnot, and the apocalypse or worldwide cataclysms, cataclysms of any type really, but the more severe a cataclysm or a a scary, terrifying type of an event is, the more the body will naturally just wipe out that memory uh, as a form of protection. So he says, I'm going to go back. I'm leaving. I'm going to go retrace our steps. I got to figure out what's going on. So he walks outside and boom, falls right into some strange otherworldly desert place right outside of their house. Everything's gone. He's looking around and check out the scenery in this particular desert, right? This place is literally um, called Saturn by Beetlejuice later on in the movie. We'll talk more about that. But I want to focus on this type of a desert. I've seen this type of a trope in many different movies um, where they have some sort of a mystical desert, a magical desert, an electric desert, a desert of, you know what I mean? A dangerous desert. But the thing that makes this desert so much different is, uh, our, well, there's two things. One is the sandworms, which obviously we're going to talk about, but two is just these structures. Look at these structures that are growing out of this desert. I'm I'm curious to, stay, to, to hear many of your ideas, but I'm going to share with you mine. I have a theory about this particular desert where the sandworms live. Do you see all these weird, strange, deformed structures that seem to be almost growing up out of the sand? They're all over the place. We have these in the world today, just not on such a large scale, um, you know, just growing up out of the desert or whatnot. We've become accustomed to this in many regions across the world. This exists in our world today, um, usually on a smaller scale, but I'm going to show you how it exists on a grand scale. It's just that we, we, uh, we don't notice it. We just walk past and we take these things for granted. So here is a fulgurite. A fulgurite is what happens when plasma restructures uh, sand and changes it into glass and other types of rock. So for example, when lightning hits sand, you can see that it sometimes um, they have to dig into the ground to actually find these, but other times they're sticking up out of the ground, just like here, right? Uh, They stick right up out of the ground. And the reason they're pulled upwards out of the ground is because of that strong electric force. When that electricity, that negative, negatively charged electricity comes down and it gets close to the ground, the ground senses it and it starts to reach up the positive forces within the dirt and the sand and stuff. They start to reach up. Um, and I've talked about many times how, um, you know, various, uh, 
independent scientists and, and other people are starting to do tests on dust storms and dirt devils or, or devil, what do you call those devil cyclones or whatever, like the dirt, dirt tornadoes and stuff like that. And they, they're recognizing that there's a high amount of electric charge within those dust devils, right? And that the electricity itself, not the wind is actually lifting up and contributing to the sand being pulled up into the air. Whenever this happens quickly, it hits it, it petrifies it, and it solidifies it, giving us these strange otherworldly looking rocks that just grow up out of the sand. Here's another example of a huge fulgurite. And here's another example. You can see how these look very much strikingly similar to uh, the desert ones. Now, I'll tell you this part. If you ever see a dirty looking one like this, on the inside, it's glass right? The sand is transformed by the plasma into a different substance. It's actually turned into a mineral, right? The outside is rock. The outside is just all the loose debris that didn't fully crystallize, um, which is also totally transformed. It used to be sand. Now it's a sand rock or um, a rock that's a sand type. I forgot what that's called, sandstone or something. But anyways, on the inside, it's a hollow glass tube. Also, Quite often, it will look like this because it's a mineral, just like salt is a mineral. Lightning can do this. Plasma can do this. Electricity can do this, which reminds me of the story in the Bible of Lot's wife, who was warned by the angels not to look back at the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, lest she be turned into a pillar of salt or into a mineral herself. Now, we see this all of the time throughout the natural world, especially in the shape of these arch arches, these arcs, these rock arches that we've been told that this type of a shape is because some water went right through this particular area and just carved it all out or whatnot. I'm not super convinced by the water theory. Can water cause erosion? Yes. Does it? Yes, absolutely. But does it make these types of shapes across the board? Is this is water solely responsible for this happening? Or is this an electrical arc caused by cosmic plasma coming down to ground itself and the sand reaches up. Just like how you see whenever they, NASA shows you the pictures of, the, of uh, the sun close up, how the sun has these little arches that go back and forth on it or whatever. Same thing, but imagine the sand or the mud went up, arches back around just following the natural current and then it gets hit by the electricity and petrifies into this exact type of a shape. There are many examples of these across the world where we have these rock arches. Sometimes this one's an arch too. Let's zoom in on this one real quick for a good example. Now, if you just take a cursory glance at it and you don't think anything of it, you would just say, oh, it's just a rock. Oh, it's just a hill. It's just some strange formation. And we don't think twice about it. But in reality, these things were created in a specific manner right? You can see the arches there underneath. Sometimes they, they look like animals, mushrooms, plants, all kinds of other things. Sometimes they might be, but other times it's just a simple byproduct of what's happening. That looks like an alien head. Look at that one right there. That looks like a little elephant, a little baby elephant and an alien head or something. But anyways, I want to, I want to help you to see these with new eyes. Instead of seeing like, uh, animals were petrified in place or, or an alien head or whatever. Um, and instead of seeing millions of years of erosion, let's look at this as something that happened quickly when the ground was actually pulled up into the air, floating up into the air, was hit by electricity, and boom, just like the fulgurites, was frozen in time, giving us all of these amazing examples. I'll show you some more here. Uh, this one, many of these tend to look like creatures and stuff because we let our imaginations run wild and we're like, wow, that definitely was an elephant. Look, it looks like, like it has an elephant trunk or something. It could be. But look at the types of rocks that these typically are. Oftentimes, they look like they're made out of dried mud, basically, right? Um, quite often, you'll see them curving and uh, making little wave patterns and stuff because they're following the electric current that is naturally abundant in the world. This one right here is really interesting. <laughs> it, my imagination sees like a titan that's trying to like get up out of the earth or something with one of its arms. Even looks like it's got some muscle there or something. Um, but these are just examples. Here's one uh, from NASA where it says the Curiosity rover. Let me zoom in on this a bit. The Curiosity rover has found strange rocks on the surface of Mars. And then they show you this. Uh, they say that the twisted stone towers sparked the imagination of NASA researchers. So apparently this is a real genuine picture of Mars. Um, I feel like this is probably on earth somewhere, but regardless, it doesn't matter. Look at these rocks just shooting up 
into these little strange pillar shapes right into the air and then frozen in place. You know what they say, the official explanation for this is, is that that's just the strongest core of, of the rock. And that over millions of years, the rest of it just kind of just went away. <laughs> it just disappeared. And, and this is a solid part and it's, and it's stood the test of time. I don't think so. This has happened the world across. We've got many different examples of places where you can see electrical scarring on the earth, electromagnetic discharge, plasma discharge, where it looks like the earth literally was just pulled upwards and then for some reason froze instantly in place, right? These ones are really good examples. They just look like, you know, imagine all that was just liquefied mud, some huge plasma tentacle swarms over overhead and it's naturally attracts it. It pulls it up into the air. Here's one in Russia where you can see along this riverbank and often, often, oftentimes right next to these huge mountains or cliffs or pillars and stuff like that, you'll see that there's rivers right next to them. That's because of how electricity acts whenever it uh, discharges onto the earth. It will pull parts of it up and the other parts will be made low. Here's another good example too. Let's check out this one. I want you to pay close attention to the top of this structure, right? The structure looks like it was pulled straight up into the air. Modern academics will have us believe that this was all solid all throughout, all the way to the top up there. And for some reason, over millions of years, uh, the rest of it disappeared, right? I mean, even if it eroded and stuff like that, like where's the erosion? Where's the rest of it? You know, it's it's not like it it just disappears, you know, it doesn't ev just evaporate. It just be piles and piles and piles that equal up to that height. You know what I mean? But anyways, these clearly were pulled up into the air. Look at the tops. They're singed, flat. They're burnt, right? I've seen that many times where right where it, like it pulls the mud up into the air, hits the top. That's going to be the most solidified portion is right there at the surface where it had contact with cosmic plasma. And then uh, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker as it goes down. So as you go down, you'll get more flaky substances and muddy and stuff like that to where it's not as solid, which I actually did a video all about because I've got rocks like this in my backyard too. So check out this video sometime if you're able to. Um, if not, and I'll make sure to replay it again, but I went up to some local rock formations where you can see the tops of these are just burnt right? And then as you go down, they're more muddy and flaky and stuff like that. Here's another top-down view of like a forest with all these different rocks shooting up. I think that one's in Russia too. Here's another one, another great example. Check this one out. This one's really interesting. They've got this Indiana Jones bridge thing that goes up to these weird spiky looking... Look at that. Does that look like erosion from the top down or does that look like something was pulled up into the air and stopped at a point, right? Uh, I'm, I'm voting for pulled up into the air, but check that out just on the edge. It's just, it's, it's just almost like it's floating there. Uh, here's some more examples of rocks that clearly look like they were pulled up into the air where the, the main story of this by academics is that this is just millions of years of erosion and it just happened to erode like that in these pillars <laughs> or whatever, right? Like how rain doesn't do that. You know what I mean? I, I I don't know. Anyways, here's another example from my own backyard. This is from the Garden of the Gods. I've actually seen this rock many different times. Um, and it looks like this entire area, the Garden of the Gods, is just a place where that cosmic snake undulated its way across this city. And, um, you know, in, in places it got close enough so that the, the mud runoff from those mountains and stuff in the Rockies, uh, was lifted up into the air and it petrified along the way. You can see a path of it when you look at a, um, a top down view too. Now this is going to come into play. This is actually a map from the wizard of Oz. I've, I've shown this map a few times. It's an exact mimicking parody version of our North Pole maps where it used to show land at the North Pole with Mount Maru being right there centrally located around this area in the middle, which is Oz, by the way, right there in the middle. And we got like Munchkin land and stuff off to the side. These are the four lands at the North Pole, um, around the North Pole on the older maps. But on the older maps that we have, this all over here is actually water. But we go through um, cycles of apocalypses. One is a water cycle where all this fills up with water and then it becomes um, a river basically or the Atlantic Ocean after a while. Um, but then once that water is removed and taken away during the next apocalyptic cycle, this all becomes desert, electrified desert. So basically this is where we are on the map whenever we see these characters 
um, if we were to put them into the same place as like with the Wizard of Oz and stuff, is the Deadly Desert, right? This is the Deadly Desert, the Impassable Desert, the Shifting Sands Desert, the Great Sandy Waste Desert, etc. Um, here is Return to Oz, just a little clip of it. When Dorothy goes back to Oz, she starts off in the des Deadly Desert. She has to cross the Deadly Desert to get to Oz. And as you can see here, it's very similar to Beetlejuice and their desert where they have all these strange rock formations all over the place, right? An electrified desert. Another version of this was seen in the never ending story where Atreyu um, leaves the, uh, the ivory tower, right? So he has to also cross a similar type of landscape. This one's got like uh, crystals, like more of like a crystal land. And this one's got these strange pillars, rock pillars and stuff up here at the top. Oh, I'm making it smaller. There you go. So that's a trail riding his horse throughout the lands. In the Dark Crystal, there is a place called the Crystal Desert. Let me read this to you. This is really interesting. In the Dark Crystal, it says, The Crystal Desert was a desert in Skarit, located beyond the northwestern perimeter of the Endless Forest. The Endless Forest is a circular forest at the North Pole that goes around in a circle. Uh, that's the magic forest and stuff. So this is just on the other side of it. Its northern edge was lined by the Claw Mountains. Um, that land at the North Pole also is said to be lined with these huge, huge mountains that just shoot up out of the ground, quite actually shooting up out of the ground, right? Which were among the only natural source of shade in the area. It also talks about how they had shifting sands and whatnot, just like in The Wizard of Oz. All right, we go back to the, uh, the movie Beetlejuice and... Uh, Barbara actually pulls Adam, that's his name, pulls Adam back in from that deadly desert area. And he's like, oh man, you saved my life. She's like, you've been gone two hours. So now we see that there is a time differential between um, outside of Eden or outside of Hyperborea or outside of those centrally located islands at the middle of the world. Um, the places outside of there versus the places inside, right? Whenever you go into Mount Maru, you gain certain attributes that allow you to live much longer. When you leave, the further outwards you go, uh, there's less energy, which means that things have shorter lifespans, more and more and more and more. All right, so she says, uh, what? He says, she says, that's how long you were gone for, so there's a time differential. Also, there's a time differential between living inside of these enclosed worlds like we do and living outside of them in the heavenlies or in the Elysian fields or space or however you'd like to see that, right? Uh, the conditions for living change, allowing people to live much longer. So it feels like time, which is sort of uh, what happens during our lifespan, right? Uh, time seems to change as well. All right, so they look down and see that there's this brand new book that says Handbook for the Recently Deceased. So they're opening it up, right? And he says, listen to this. They open up this book and it's just jargon. They don't understand it. They don't know what's going on. There's just a book there to help them out for being dead. He says, listen to this. Geographical and temporal parameters. Oh, I'm sorry, perimeters, right? Or boundaries, just like the het that we talked about earlier, right? That's exactly what this book is talking about. So when you study these things, you'll be more well-versed in them and you won't get all fed up like he does in the movie and slam the book closed and be like, man, I don't get any of this, right? That's why we study these things now so they may be useful to us in a time to come. Geographic and temporal perimeters. A perimeter is a boundary, just like that het or that uh, the boundary, the earth boundary. So we're talking about earth boundaries Temporal basically means earth, earthly or limited. Functional perimeters or boundaries vary from manifestation to manifestation. These boundaries, these markers change from their manifestations, right? From manifestation to manifestation. Uh, this is basically just a technical way of describing the anode and cathode mountains and other markers and boundaries that we go over here on my channel quite often. Uh, the word temporal equates to terrestrial, earthly, also by extension, temporary or lasting only for a time, as opposed to heavenly, which lasts much longer because uh, entropy is increased inside of these enclosed worlds, when, especially whenever you have um, the cycle where the energy is being charged, where it's being pulled inward towards the source, towards the center of the world. And those who are on the surface suffer because they're losing energy, right? 
All right, so uh, they go back and lay in their bed. Check this bed out real quick. Four posts, just like how we've talk, been talking about uh, those four creatures that surround the throne of God, which seems to be symbolic for Mount Maru, basically, where uh, the presence sits or where that energy resides. Uh, you'll see this quite often in the movies, so keep an eye out for these four posts, especially when it's on a bed that doesn't need to have posts for any reason. There's no canopy there. There's nothing. There's just these four posts, right? All right, so we go over to Beetlejuice's house. Let's check this out real quick. He, he's got these little flyers that he leaves out for his job, which is an, a bio exorcist. And it's interesting. Look at the spelling. They spelled the name of the movie Beetlejuice, just like how we say it in American, right? But it's actually not Beetlejuice. It's Betelgeuse or Betelgeese, right? What is that from? Let's check out the origin of the name Beetlejuice. Now, let's start in Arabic because I believe that that's where most of my research was heading towards. The ancient Arab astronomers saw something different in the sky. Where we see Orion and Gemini, they saw a female warrior and her name was al Jauza. al Jauza. So you, you can kind of hear the juice in the Jauza part of it, right? Meaning the central one. al Jauza means the central one, al Jauza. See that? How it kind of turns into juice, right? All right, so she may have been associated with the goddess Al-Uzza, the mightiest one. The name of the bright orange star on Orion's shoulder, aka Orion's armpit, uh, Beetlejuice, hints at Orion's alternate depiction. It comes from the words Yad al Jauza. That is actually pronounced Yauza, just so you know. So that J is actually a, a capital I or a Y as you go further back in time. So it's literally the word Yauza, which is interesting too. Uh, so it means the hand of the central one or the armpit of the central one, right? So that's interesting too, that they had Orion as a female. Here's another image. This is the actual Orion in the sky. If you look up in the sky and you see these three dots, boom, boom, and boom, that's Orion's belt. This is important for us because it helps us to learn orientation in the world where we are. It's a sky map, basically. So this is Orion's belt. If you go in one direction, you have sort of these three stars are kind of like the head, I guess, of Orion. It's kind of hard to see him. But anyways, this you have like this orange looking one and a blue one. These are the shoulders or the armpits of uh, Orion. This orange colored one is Beetlejuice. Let's learn a little bit about Beetlejuice. In the modern day, this is really interesting because it says here, uh, the Hubble helps to uncover the mystery of the dimming of Beetlejuice. This star, Beetlejuice, has been dimming over time, over the last, I don't know, decade and a half, something happened with Betelgeuse. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in 2019, this star noticeably started becoming dimmer and dimmer. And here is an alleged NASA photograph of the event of the star actually becoming more and more dim, as you can see. So check this out. This is what they say. They say that the dimming of the supergiant star was most likely caused by a dust cloud that had blocked starlight coming from the star's surface. So they're saying that this is a big old huge cloud of dust that's just moved in front of that star. Interesting. I've got my own theories on that. Basically, I feel like this is an eclipse of whatever that heavenly light source is because I believe they can all be eclipsed. Uh, you just have to block out their light. Um, but dust, that's a super giant star. And <laughs> in their model, uh, in their model, that's a lot of dust. And basically here, let me tell you the story. So in 2019 or 16 or something, uh, they say, NASA says specifically, that Betelgeuse, they, they caught it erupting. That instead of a, uh, what is that called when our sun shoots out a, a coronal mass ejection, right? Betelgeuse had something like that, but much bigger. It literally had a surface mass ejection where it blew off. And this is the official story. It blew off a chunk of its own surface, just shooting it out into space, plasma, right? Then they're saying that that plasma immediately turned into dust in space for some reason. And that that dust turned into a huge cloud that dimmed Beetlejuice. Isn't that an interesting story? I've got so many alternative ideas that it, <laughs> that help to make that make sense, but that's what, that's what they're saying about Beetlejuice. All right, so here's Beetlejuice checking out the the Help Wanted ads, which is basically the obituary, and he said he sees our main characters. Their name is the Maitlands. 
This is a strange, uncommon last name. So I looked it up. This is the last name of our protagonist. So we're going to check out what the name means. Maitland is a boy's name of Scottish origin. Traditionally a surname brought to Scotland by the Normans. Uh, and basically it, it implies a meadow or bad tempered. Here's where it comes from. It's like wildflowers that grow freely and untamed, just like all those things that grow in a, in a meadow. So their last name implies those who are from an untamed meadow or a meadow that is a wilderness or a valley that is untouched by man, right? Just like they're representative of Adam and Eve, basically, or people who live at the garden or the place of the garden. Now let's check out their names real quick. You can see that um, they've got like this little setup of their scale model. The woman's name is Barbara. The man's name is pretty obvious what he, what he represents symbolically. He represents the first man. He represents Adam. But Barbara is an interesting name for his mate, right? Now, her name could be interpreted as Barb, which is a spike, a spire, a column, a beam, etc. And then Or, or Or, which means light. So a beam of light is what this could be interpreted as. It is also Barbar, or Barbarian. It, her, the name Barbara literally is directly comes from the word Barbarian, just so you know. So Adam has a wife who is a barbarian symbolically in the movie. What does barbarian mean? When we think of barbarian, we have been conditioned to think of just, you know, people that smell and they're just dirty and they're sort of aggressive and mean and bad. It's really been demonized, the words themselves, right? I'll tell you where it comes from. Let's take a look at it. We're doing an, uh, a word breakdown. It's called etymology. And we're looking at the word barbarian. It says a non-Roman or a non Greek. Uh, earlier, it was just barbar, which is the word bar twice. Those barriers, barrier number one, barrier number two. And then if you're from those barriers, you're, you live between them, right? It's the anode and cathode mountain, right? The bar and the bar or the beam and the beam or the column and the column, right? So the barbarians are those who stem from or were thought to come from a strange land, a strange place, which is between the pillars of Hercules or the two bars. So they were called the barbars. All right. So it says, uh, basically, this was a name that was given to imply a stranger. Medieval Latin, barbarinus, barbarinus, uh, from old French, barbarin, barbin, berber, uh, pagan, basically it means pagan as well, which means those from the pag, which is the hook, which is the sky beam that shoots up and connects the earth to the sky, right? Uh, usually they emit from mountainous areas because like I showed you before, they pull the earth upwards and they create hills and mounds and mountains and pyramids and all kinds of interesting shapes electrically. Um, so the people from that are the hill people. Uh, Latin barbaris, which means strange, foreign, barbarous, basically means stranger. It means something different, an alien person who is just altogether different and does not share your societal norms. That's what that implies. So he says, cute, cute couple. <laughs> I'm going to try. <coughs> I'm going to try. I can't do it. I tried impersonating Beetlejuice's voice. It's, it's the same as Michael Keaton doing his little Batman, you know, like way down here, it's like doing an Alex Jones impersonation. So it, it kills my vocal cords. So I probably won't impersonate him too much. He says, cute couple, uh, look nice and stupid too. That's what the barbarians were thought to be, right? These uncouth strangers from other worlds. Sometimes they were called, uh, referred to as those from the two bars or the two uh, barriers or boundaries or earth boundaries, right? Sometimes it was tar, which meant tree or the two trees of our world. And uh, the people who live between those two trees, they were called the tartars, the barbars, the tartars. They have different descriptions for people and animals alike from those particular areas. And the Tartarians, the barbarians, etc., so on and so forth, they were all seen as being stupid because they were strangers, because they didn't understand. They were altogether ignorant. Just like it says, when we look at the description of barbarians, look down at the bottom. Strange, ignorant. 
right? Not not purposefully stupid or anything, not, not like it's an insult. It's just that they are altogether ignorant of our societal norms, of our ways, of our technology and whatever progress we have made on our little path when they leave that land and they come and visit us. Cute people look nice and stupid too. All right, so now we meet, um, there's a new family that's going to move into this house since Adam and Barbara are dead now. Uh, we meet one of them who walks in right now. She's always has this red hair, very pale face. She definitely represents those beings who descend from space and where they descend is out of that hole where the where the, the atmosphere depressurizes, which is at the top of our sky, which is directly above Mount Maru at the bottom. That is the holy mountain where these angels, these beings, these demons, whatever you want to call them, that's where they land. They land straight down. They come into the world and obviously they're going to go straight down and they're going to land on that holy mountain. And there is a battle. Like there is, there is one race of humanoid beings and another altogether different race of humanoid beings. There are those who are survivors like us who are small and tiny and look altogether different because we've been living under altogether different conditions. And then you have those other space beings who live in their own conditions and they descend down and they're usually much bigger, very pasty skin, pale. Uh, sometimes they're said as when they had hair as having red hair. These are the killer clowns from outer space. These are the ones that have pasty uh, look to them and they typically have red hair and they have like, you you know, red lips and stuff like that. This one's name is Delia. Delia Dietz. This is the Dietz family. Let's check out that those words. Let's start with Delia. Delia means of Delos. Delos is the tiny island in the Aegean. This is a modern description, okay? I don't believe it is in the Aegean whatsoever. Not the original, right? There may be a modern day Delos that was named after the quintessential original Delos Island, right? But anyways, Delia means of Delos, the tiny island at the Aegean Sea that was the reputed birthplace of Apollo and Artemis. Two beams, two boundaries, two sky beams, two gods, etc., two twins of that island. Last name, Dietz. Let's check this one out. I'm going to make it a little bigger so you can check it out too. All right, so the last name Dietz is a German personal name from Theodoric, Theodoric, which is composed of the elements uh, Theudo, meaning people, race, and Rik, which means power. So powerful race, basically, is what their last name means. So this family, let me go back to this real quick. These two right here, their last name means powerful race or powerful family, a family that is powerful. That's the last name. Dilia means of Delos. That is that is another name and a long list of names over time that have that have been used to describe this magical, mystical, hidden land up at the North Pole um, that goes by so many different names. So basically, we've got two families, right? The arrivals, those who drop down from the sky, basically, who are seen as the killer clowns, the Anunnaki, etc., uh, they're going to have to fight over this land. Who is going, you know, what rules are we going to live by? How are we going to get along? Uh, there may have be, even been physical fighting and war between these two different families, the survivors here, the natural born, and those who are strangers entering in from the sky, basically. Uh, also, it reminded me of Westworld too. Delos is the name of the company that owns the entire Westworld organization. And their their headquarters is in one of these mesas, just like how we talked about how the electricity pulls the sand up, hits it, turns flat on top, and you get a mesa, etc. This was the Delos Corporation in Westworld. Now, they have a friend named Otho. Here's Otho. He's coming in through the window for some strange reason. So he says it's uh, bad luck, I guess. But anyways, Otho's name means wealth. And he definitely represents somebody who is wealthy in the movie. Um, he's very holier than thou, very, the entire family is wealthy and they, they make a very good point about how wealthy and rich they are. They're all very wealthy. They're all very rich. It's a powerful, rich, wealthy family. Do you see where I'm going with that? Right? So they all start moving in to this place. All right. So these two are like, screw this, man. I don't want to live with these people. I'm out of here. So, um, Barbara just runs out the back door immediately falling down into the deadly desert where we have all these different fulgurites from the cosmic plasma that have come down and hit the sands where this used to be ocean as well, by the way. So 
Um, and this is also no. Check this out. So they 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 catch up with one another. And this place is called Saturn. I don't know if it actually is, you know, Saturn. I'm gonna come to that in just a minute. But she says, help, I'm getting all yellow. This was just slipped in there real quick, right? This wasn't a big, like, I don't see her turning yellow, but they have that as part of the script. She had to say that because they either forgot to take it out or forgot to tell us why that's important that she's turning yellow. She says she's getting all yellow. That's because whenever you go from the land of water to the land of desert, basically, the light spectrum starts to change. As we've talked about during my uh, theory called the Hyperborean Electrical Arc Theory, where we have an electrical arc that comes up and is connected between the Anode and Cathode Mountains on either side of the Garden of Eden, right? Creating an electrical arc or the Ark of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant, etc. And that light, after a time, is monochromatic and it turns yellow. So there's just yellow light all over the place. So it makes sense that she's saying, help, I'm getting all yellow in the desert world. Uh, first, it'll be purple, then it'll be red, then it'll be yellow or the Golden Age. All right, now we meet the sandworms, right? I love these things. They struck, there's something about them, right? I just, I like them. They're strange, they're weird, but there is, the thing that I like about them is because truth resonates with me. I see truth when I look at this. And at first, when I, before I researched, before I put one foot in front of the other and started checking into these things, I had no idea what this even represented, right? But then I started researching and I noticed Let's, let's break it down, right? It's got a head inside of a head. It's got a, a jaw inside of a jaw. It opens its mouth and you see another creature come out, just like in the alien movies with the xenomorphs, right? Uh, or how about the graboids in Tremors, right? The graboids, they open their mouth and another set of jaws or mouth or teeth or whatever comes out. Here's various versions of the exact same things, the sandworms. These are phantozoids. These are types of phantozoids. They're otherworldly alien worms. They don't have to be alien as in coming from another place. Remember, remember, gigantism will be reintroduced into our world after the polarity shift. So regular worms and creatures of all sizes get bigger bigger and bigger and bigger as well. <clears throat> but we do have huge ones that are already existent inside the hollow recesses of our world and out there in what we call space, right? So we've got these various ones that have been featured in different movies. There's Jeff, right? Um, so we've got the, the dune sandworm, obviously, right? And uh, we've got, that's another one that's from the movie Dune. I have not seen this movie yet, but it comes up quite often. Uh, there's Jeff from Men in Black. This one is a real one. Now this is a cartoon, but I'm gonna, let's check it out real quick. It's called the Bobbit Worm. This is, a, this is a drawing of a real actual worm, which I'm gonna show you right now. It says, this worm is surprisingly large and a vicious predator. Though it usually stays in its burrow, its jaws can reach out and slice a fish in half. This is a worm that eats fish. Like my have how the tables have turned, right? This is actually what it looks like. This I've shown this a few times on my channel. This is literally actually a sandworm. They are not fictional, okay? They are real creatures that do exist. These nasty little devils, they burrow they burrow themselves down in the sand. They can move around in the sand and everything, and they have these huge outer jaw things that they open up like a bear trap. And whenever something gets close, they they snap it and they drag it down underneath the sand. Check this out. This article is talking about these types of worms, and it says these worms range from 2 to 4 feet in length. That is in the modern world before any other changes to our environment to uh, add to their gigantism. However, they can grow up to 10 feet long. In the modern world, those deadly looking nasty worm things can be 10 feet long, right? But there are several unverified claims that these marine worms can reach lengths between 35 and 50 feet long. They are fast growing and their growth depends upon the availability of food. So, what we have in our real natural world is shown to us and presented back to us in fiction, like this movie, like in Beetlejuice, right? All right, so we go back to uh, Delia. Delia's rocking, her whole family rocks the black and white symbolism, okay? Uh, the black and white symbolism, as we've talked about, is represented, uh, it represents space travel. It represents, well, not really space travel, it represents sliders. It represents those who travel from realm to realm. Realms do not have to be 
up there in the sky. There are realms below as well. But somebody who goes from realm to realm typically wears this black and white symbolism. Uh, also, that's the reason why Adam has this black and white shirt, while Beetlejuice has black and white. There's black and white symbolism all over this place. Now, they go to their chimney, which represents Mount Maru once more, as we talked about. Um, and the chimney opens up. They draw a door on it, or the letter D, or the Dalet. They draw this into the door, and it opens up, and there's this green light flooding out, which is another symbolic element. The color green oftentimes represents the heart of the world, or earth energy. Now, we move back out. We pan out. And look what the Dietzes have done. They've changed the architecture, right? They've made this some weird looking museum, uh, new, new agey looking, I don't know, house or whatever, right? But that's what happens whenever we have these two different factions from two different times, we've got two different styles of architecture that they're used to having. One style has architecture, um, that is designed to support, um, life in an electrically charged atmospheric environment, I would say. The other one lacks that electrically charged atmosphere. So their uh, architecture looks altogether different. So there's this sort of change in the architecture as there's this change in residency, um, as you can see. All right. So they go down into this Mount Maru looking office space where you have these sort of government workers of the undead, right? This is exactly like, or very similar to when you watch all these different movies where like somebody goes up into space or beyond the, you know, the multiverse or whatever, and there's some sort of an agency like, like space cops or like a space FBI type of a place or something. And they're always a throwback. They're always, they're, they're never caught up to modern times. They're almost never futuristic as you would expect them to be. If anything, it clashes because you expect them to be very futuristic because they're from some other realm, some other place. But every time we look at these types of uh, government agencies that, you know, keep tabs on the world of the living or various universes or various worlds and stuff like that, they're very retro. They're very old school. They got typewriters and stuff, not a lot of electricity going on. Or if they do have it, it's like really out of date looking stuff. Same thing here. Um, you know, you'll be able to see that if you zoom in on it. <coughs> Pardon me. All right. So they go down and you can see the black and white symbolism, the black and white checkerboard floor as well. This is the halls of Amenti. If you've ever checked out the, um, uh, the Emerald Tablets, basically. They walk up to the sixth door, number six, the spiral. The sixth door is the one that leads them back home. So they walk through that door. They don't recognize their house anymore. The Dietzes have totally changed everything around. It's cold. It's, it's out of place. It's not homey. It doesn't have that crunchy, feely nature kind of vibe to it anymore. It's just removed. It looks more like a, a weird, cold cement prison cell museum or something, right? Now, this woman, this old woman pops up named Juno. She's their caseworker. Check this out. In uh, the Roman belief system, they had a goddess that was named Juno. And it says here, the Roman goddess of adult women and marriage. So it's appropriate that she is in charge of these two newlyweds or these two married, uh, this married couple. And she's literally their caseworker. She's the sister and the wife of Jupiter, um, and Juno. So I'm going to break that down real quick. I didn't take pictures of it because I already have it all memorized, but the root of Juno is actually gun, which is garden. O just means of the garden, right? It's the exact same as Janus. That's why she's the right wife of Jupiter, etc. right? Now she's talking about Beetlejuice and she says, he was my assistant as a freelance bio exorcist. <laughs> uh, so Beetlejuice basically represents the red plasma spectrum, right? That, that plasma, that all it knows is to exercise humans, to get rid of life, to destroy things. And it's not bad. It's not seen as being bad on a certain level. It's seen as being necessary. It's a necessary evil. That's what Beetlejuice is. He and that energy is here to destroy things, to, to tear them down, to tear them apart, so from our human perspective, that's seen as murder and killing and death and all kinds of bad stuff, right? Because we seek to preserve ourselves. So we see people like Beetlejuice as a bad guy, typically. Uh, he claimed that he could get rid of the living, right? That's also the plasma. Now we go to Lydia. Lydia, awesome character. Uh, she says, 
Oh, they're asking Lydia, how do you see us? Because she can clearly see the, the two ghosts or whatever, and nobody else can see them. And she read through that, that book, and it says, live people often ignore the strange and unusual. I myself am strange and unusual. <laughs> um, which makes a lot of sense to any, I don't even need to explain this to all of you out there who are already strange and unusual. You get it. I feel like it's innate within us. It's, it's a, it's inside of us already. You are starting to understand as am I, that we are able to tap into the esoteric, the fringe, the occult, uh, the things that are just beyond the actual visual sight of regular people who are just walking around in their loops. We're able to see beyond those loops because we resonate with that vibe. All right, so we go to Beetlejuice and they're like, Beetlejuice is like, hey, let me kill, let me kill that family. I'll get rid of them for you. Uh, you know, they won't ever come back, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Adam is like, oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Stop rushing us. Stop rushing us. Uh, what are your, we, we need to know some stuff. And he's like, what do you want to know? He's like, I don't know. What, what are your qualifications? Right? Adam asks him, what are your qualifications? Just as an immediate regurgitation of how we approve of people during this modern world that we live in, right? You need to list, it's like, it's like, you know, YouTube or anything else, it's the same thing. People feel the need to list all of their achievements and qualifications and this and that. It's because he comes from a place where we're, people are far removed from one another, the modern times right? So they don't know these people. So they they need to get more information before they just like make a decision to hire them. So he's like, oh, uh, what are my qualifications? Well, I attended Juilliard. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Business School. I traveled quite extensively. I've seen The Exorcist about 167 times, not to mention the fact that you're talking to a dead guy. <laughs> now, what do you think? Am I qualified? <laughs> Angel Wings just gave a J Dreamers membership. Thank you, Angel Wings, and congrats to whoever picks up on that. All right, so this is great. He's making a really good point about qualifications, right? It doesn't matter. I could literally go to McDonald's and lie and just pretend like I have a bunch of qualifications to flip burgers at McDonald's. Um, or I could say, yeah, I totally graduated high school or, uh, I mean, I did, but you know what I mean? I, they don't check on all that stuff. That's just the system that we live in. It's pre, It's pretense. All right. So then he like his face opens up, right? There's this part just for a quick second where his face opens up and you've got all these weird tentacle alien looking arm things that are reaching out of his face. They don't show you what it actually looks like, but symbolically, this is like, uh, I used to call this like being infected with the T virus, basically like, um, when I look and I research phantasoids or those otherworldly space creatures or demonic creatures or monsters or whatever you'd like to call them, cryptids and stuff, right? Quite often I run across a type that has the ability to open its face, that its face actually splits open in order to eat its, its meals, basically, right? Uh, it's different types of phantasoids. Also, I have a theory that there are different types of phantasoids that lay their eggs and procreate by hatching them in human bodies, right? Which is like, uh, you know, probably the best movie reference for something like that would be either um, The Thing, right? With Kurt Russell, The Thing is a really good example. And um, damn, what was that one with the zombies with the T-virus? I forgot the name of it, but you know what I'm talking about. All right, so Beetlejuice is really trying to get their business. He wants to really kill these people and escape his little microcosm world that he lives in. He says, look, oh, we've been to Saturn. Hey, I've been to Saturn. Um, this is really weird too. This is just barely, barely even mentioned. I guess that he either saw some yellow on her or he saw that she had all the sand and stuff from that place, from that desert world. He calls that Saturn, which is really interesting too. Saturn meaning uh, the horned one. So he's been to Saturn as well, space traveler symbolism, etc. Now, if we check out Saturn real quick, let's just give us a quick read. It says, an ancient uh, Italian deity popularly believed to have appeared in Italy in the reign of Janus. So during the reign of Janus, Saturn was a, apparently some another godlike figure that popped up and to have instructed the people in agriculture, gardening, etc., uh, alleviating them from the barbarism, there's that word again, to social order and civilization. His reign was sung by the poets as the golden age. 
right? So that may be why she was turning yellow, right? Because she was entering into the golden age. The golden age doesn't mean perfect, just so you know. It's just a color description of the atmosphere, the sky itself, how everything turns more of a yellow color. Also, in general, things are better, right? But does that mean that evil is eradicated? Does that mean people and animals and stuff won't have any problems at all? That it's just a 100% complete utopia? No. It just means it's better by extension than the world that we live in right now, which is like not the golden age, basically. All right. So they take off. They're like, okay, this guy's way too much, way too much. And they leave and he's like, you bunch of losers. Ah, and then the tree falls, falls down behind him. He also lives on a little hill on a little microcosm version of Mount Maru. And that tree falls down, right? Which represents the tree of life that comes up and it falls down. And this, it, it does that in the movie too, because Adam keeps putting the tree back up. Beetlejuice will kick it back down. And he's like, nice fucking model. <laughs> he grabs himself. Um, that's funny too, because um, of the models of our world that different organizations and people have, right? Obviously, Beetlejuice has his own way of describing other people's models, <clears throat> which I can relate to. All right. So now um, we've got all these rich guests that are invited to dinner, right? Every, it's very hoity-toity. It's, it's just not my style whatsoever. So they all sit down and there's like this bowl of shrimp. And then they become possessed and they start, uh, they start doing like the, what was that called? The, the mamba or whatever that is. Right. And they're all dancing to this song. And the song is, uh, it's the banana boat song, right? When he's like, day, uh, I can't, I don't know if I could do it. Day -o. I can't do it. Day -o. Day -o. Daylight come and me one go home. Anyways, the whole song is about this dude who's basically s working slave labor all night long, stacking bananas. And all he wants to do is go home, man. He wants his loop to be over with. He needs a break. He needs a vacation from it all. And they play that song throughout the movie. So as they're eating, uh, their shrimp turns into these hands or whatever, and the hands attach right to the face. And then they pull them straight down, um, sort of just rendering them immobile, right? Uh, before it finally pushes them away and let's go. Walking Dead, hey, welcome to my channel. Thanks for subscribing. That's awesome. All right, so what this reminded me of with the little shrimp face glove or whatever stuck to their faces is what I call the dream crabs, right? Um, or the face huggers. I mean, that dream crab is actually from Doctor Who, but we see this time and time again in the movies. This one is an example. This is uh, Starro. Uh, this is actually from the movie, The Suicide Squad, but Starro goes back much further than The Suicide Squad in the comics. He's one of the huge, craziest bad guys in the DC world, even though he's one of the cheesiest looking ones of all of them. Basically, he's a giant starfish with an eyeball in the middle, right? But whenever he makes his appearance into Earth, there's many different Earths in the DC realm, okay? There's infinite Earths. So they don't have like, I mean, I guess you could say they have many different planets or whatever, but basically every planet is like a, a different earth, basically. Um, when Starro appears, he's a world eater. He's a world destroyer, a world conqueror, and all these tiny little versions of him, which are smaller starfish, they fly out and they look for people to attach to and they attach right to their face. And when this happens, they become possessed. And now they do whatever Staros wants them. I mean, not Staros, Staro, whatever Staro wants them to do, right? Uh, it's a form of plasma possession, which is why you have that tentacle look where it's like fingers or starfish or whatever, something that's attached to the face. And then the people go into a dreamlike state, right? Where they're easily controlled. They can be, uh, their mind is controlled. They can be given visions and stuff like that. The face huggers are a good example from Alien, right? And look at the co look at the color of them too. It's twofold symbolism. One is plasma that seeks to attach to your face. Um, and it's probably because it's a data harvest. That's my, that's my guess on that right now, that they're actually like doing that purposefully to like download your mind <laughs> or your information, which is data. Um, but yeah, this is interesting too. With the blocking of the eyes, I'm also thinking of another movie. Uh, that one with Sandra Bullock where she, they had like blindfolds and stuff so that they didn't look at the monsters or whatever. Anyway, similar stuff. But it's also got phantazoid symbolism too because of the colors of the phantazoid, that phantazoid white color. Now, this guy, Mr. Dietz, gets up and he says, people are going to pay big money for this, right? They were all just possessed. They witnessed ghost paranormal activity. And the first thing that this dude thinks of is how can I make money off of this, right? 
something real, something tangible that comes from some other place, instead of becoming a philosopher, he becomes a businessman about it. So people like this, I have a personal disconnect with because that's their consumers. That's all that they are interested in doing. They're, they're interested in money, which is also known as currency or a current, right? Uh, energy and where energy flows from. So this is what this guy reminds me of. Uh, this is the exact same actor, but this is in Howard the Duck, which we also broke down in my Truth in Movies. That was one of my first ones. Um, but in Howard the Duck, he's also a consumer that loves the currency or the current, right? Where he actually sticks out this weird tongue and he takes all that current into his body. All right, we go back to Beetlejuice, who turns into a snake, a rattlesnake specifically. Remember that. I, I, I didn't grab a picture of his rattle, but remember that he's specifically a rattlesnake. That's going to come into play in just a minute. And he comes, he picks up Chuck Dietz, and he's like, we've come for your daughter, Chuck. Why is that interesting? And then he grows horns. So he came for the daughter, and then he grows horns, or he becomes horny right? He's got all these horns all over him. He says, we've come for your daughter, Chuck. Remember, he represents the killer clowns from outer space or those Anunnaki, those beings, those angels or whatever that came down. And then they started to mate with the women of our world, right? Or this happened to them, right? Now, on another level, this right here is symbolic, not just of him being in the mood or whatever, but it's symbolic of, remember when we broke down um, one of those movies where we're talking about how like um, the origin for biker gear and how that why they have spikes on their leather padding and spikes on their helmets and stuff like that because they acted as little lightning rods to keep away lightning whenever they're moving about in this new environment that is an electrically charged atmosphere, right? It actually helps to keep that off, especially if you're moving at high speeds um, like bikers do, right? And then, of course, they turn on the red lights because he's now in the red light district because he's full of horns or thorns, right? Um, and it's also symbolic of the sky itself changing to that red color. And therefore, he needs these spikes so that he doesn't get zapped by electricity. All right. So now we go back to Lydia, which I feel super sorry for. I, oh, man, like my... I know, I know the movie's funny and everything, but God, like I think a lot of us love this character not just because she's different and she's emo or she's gothic or she's whatever, you know what I mean? And we're into that kind of stuff. I mean, I wear black all the time, right? It's because I, I resonate with her energy signature, her frequency, her vibe. She is a good person or seems to be, right? A good natured person who is friendly, obviously making friends with ghosts and animals and all, all that kind of stuff. But she's super depressed. She can't stand the world that she lives in. She's literally sitting here writing her death note. She's about to, she's planning on killing herself. So she's sat down and she's writing this uh, death note about how badly the world sucks and she just wants to leave. You know what I mean? That is many of our conditions in the world that we live in today. The world's crumbling. It's falling apart. I just did a huge rant video in my Omens part two or whatever um, about that condition and how it makes me feel personally. So I can totally relate to Lydia's circumstance. Also, she represents those people who are not getting ready to kill themselves, but those who are getting ready to leave this world. Not through death, though. All right, so she meets Beetlejuice and he says, uh, all right, uh, you got to let me out of here, but you got to say my name three times, right? That's kind of interesting. Three times in a row. I'm going to come back to Beetlejuice and his name. So she's like, all right, well, what's your name? Uh, well, uh, I, I can't tell you. What? Why? Why? That's weird. You can't tell me your own name. This is this should definitely raise a flag for those of us who are studying the movie instead of just watching the movie, right? Why is it that certain characters are not allowed to have their names said or they're not allowed to speak their own name? For example, Rumpelstiltskin, right? Who is also this sort of magical, mystical goblin type creature that could grant wishes or whatever. Um, he kept his name a huge secret. Um, I, I did highlight a lot of this, so I'm actually just going to read some of it here. But it says that the name Rumpelstiltskin in German means literally little rattle stilt. Remember that. A stilt being a post or a pole that provides support for a structure very similar to the posts of the world or the, the four corners of the world, et cetera, the sky beams that reach up to the sky, right? A Rumpelstilt, or a Rumpelstilts, was consequently the name of a type of goblin 
also called a popart or a popart. And those make noises by rattling posts and rapping on planks. Rapping in the old days meant to knock on something, right? This is just like, remember when we were breaking down um, Donnie Darko and the mom, or I think the dad was reading a Stephen King book called The Tommy Knockers? The same exact thing. It's plasma that goes around and it can interact with physical objects and it pops, right? It's electricity. It makes these popping, knocking type noises and stuff. It's, it's electricity in nature. So they're called the Rumpelgeist or the Rattling Ghost. Remember earlier, Beetlejuice had the rattle. He turned into the rattling snake or plasma, right? Or a poltergeist, a mischievous spirit that clatters and moves household objects, right? Uh, which is also what the energy can do. Uh, paranormal activity, paranormal energy, plasma, uh, electricity, etc. Other related concepts are mummarts, bo bogarts, hobs, uh, which are mischievous household spirits that disguise themselves. I feel like this microphone's a bit too close. I'm going to back that off. <clears throat> Sorry about that. All right, let's move forward. Here's another one, right? So you can't say Beetlejuice's name. He's not allowed to tell people. He's a nameless entity. Even though he has a name, his name is not to be said. Just like Voldemort. Voldemort is so feared in the wizarding world that it is considered dangerous to even speak his name. Most characters in the novels refer to him as you know who, right? Or he who must not be named, rather than just saying his name, even though realistically they say Voldemort freaking all the time in the Harry Potter movies. Um, but uh, we also have another example of this in Sauron, which, by the way, this looks like an eyeball, but it's really uh, a dude with horns standing there in the middle. Can you see that? See that? How there's a little horn dude? Standing there, it looks like a serpentine eye or something, but it's actually like a, a guy standing in fire. All right, so um, Sauron, Sauron, Sauron is another one where in the movie he's confronted by like the elf queen and she says, You have no power here, servant of Morgoth. You are nameless, faceless, formless, because he's plasma as well. Now, why not talk about it? She says, go back to the void from whence you came. Now, check this out. Historically, this also has happened in our literature and our religions. Solomon, the famous king of old, confronted a demon, forced the demon not only to give up his name, but also to explain to the king how exactly the king could keep power over that demon. Once Orneus did this, Solomon sealed him with the seal of the ring and forced the demon to carve out stone blocks for building the temple, the famous temple of Solomon. Eventually, Solomon summoned and subjugated all of the demon lords, starting with Beelzebul himself, and forced them to work on the temple. So, let me describe this way shorter, okay? There was a famous king, a legendary king named Solomon, the son of David. Solomon had been given uh, magical artifacts, specifically three, one of them being his ring of power, right? Um, what he would do is he would call upon different demonic entities and he would, um, they would be forced to do whatever he said, right? They were under his complete control and power and he asked them first what their name was, right? That was super important. It wasn't about being casual. It wasn't like, hey, what's up, demon? Uh, my name's King Solomon. What's your name? You know, you're going to be working on the castle. Welcome. You know, it's not like that. He needed the name because names provide information, which provides power to the person who knows it. Names are descriptors. Names tell us what these things actually do. In our world today, you're all nameless, okay? I'm just being honest. Like, I'm nameless, you're nameless, because in general, Names have lost their meaning. People just name people names because it sounds cool. And they have no idea what they're naming their kids. Some people go to such extremes in this fallen state that the world lives in right now that they purposefully name their kids vile and base and evil things. And then the world gets more and more evil. Go figure, right? Anyways, uh, names are powerful things, right? So to know the name of something is to know its, um, its attributes, right? Which gives you a leg up. Now, that also reminds me of in the Bible, there is a commandment. The third commandment says, thou shalt not 
take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now it's written in various ways, you know, in various belief systems, religions, uh, cultures and stuff. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, if you break that down into the uh, Paleo-Hebrew or into the Phoenician and you reread this, see that word vain right there? Most people, they misinterpret that word. Vain or vanity means selfishness in our modern world. Back then, that was an implication, but it really meant emptiness. It meant to be worthless. It meant to disappear. It meant to be to not exist. So this commandment, whenever you rewrite it and retransliterate it back into its original language, means you shall not make the name of God disappear. You shall not bring that name to nothing. You shall not make that name meaningless, which is exactly what the Jewish people traditionally did in their culture is um, whenever they went into exile, the story goes that the uh, the pagan people or the, the people who are not Jews, they heard the name of God being uttered by the Jews and then they started making fun of it and they called the Jews yahoos and they were using the name of God and stuff as a derogatory term and the Jews didn't like that. So they made their own rule outside of any actual uh, rules that existed, just sort of a tradition saying, hey, you're all going to stop saying that name so that it doesn't cross the heathen lips. And because they did that, they actually transgressed the very commandment that they were trying to uphold, uh, forgetting the name of their God. <clears throat> so their God became the nameless one too. All right, cool. So we get back to Adam and Barbara. And uh, they're trying to transform themselves into these scary creatures and stuff or whatever. They look like birds to me. They look like they made themselves some giant bird heads. So they're kind of like, that's the bird-headed God symbolism. Now we go back to the Dietzes and they're having a seance because they want to make money. They want to, the ghost to appear so that they can charge people for it. They don't want to get to know the ghost. They don't want to know how that works. Nothing. It's very much all about money for them. So they lay out the wedding dress over there on the left and the uh, the groom's suit on the table. And they're going to bring the dead back to life. Another element that actually physically happens in our world that many religions and cultures across time have made reference to, the day of judgment, the day where the, the dead are resurrected, the day where the world will suffer a zombie apocalypse, basically. And it's because of the energy. All that energy comes into our world and brings things to life. It can't help it. It is its very nature to do this. All right. So, um, the clothing starts to fill up with energy. As you can see, it's that green inner earth energy. And Barbara fills up her wedding dress and then instantly turns old. She just starts, just like in, in uh, what was that movie? Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where that one dude drank out of the wrong grail and just instantly started changing to, to turn super old. That's what happens to these two, right? Because they went from one condition, one atmosphere to another atmosphere or another realm or another place where um, the conditions changed that do not contribute to regeneration of their their cells and their growth and the, uh, their health and stuff like that. But then this is the world we live in. Just so you know, I just want to make a clear reminder. This super aging, fast aging world that they're showing us, right? Because before when they were like this, that's them at Mount Maru. But now they've been taken out of Mount Maru, out of that underworld and brought into a different realm and they're starting to age super fast. They get old super fast. This is happening right now. The world is filled with entropy that is growing and getting stronger day by day, which causes people to age and causes the average lifespan to shrink and shrink and shrink as well as physical stature. People shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. It's just that we're the frog in the pot and the water is slowly getting hotter and once we get used to the water getting hotter, that water can get hotter even faster exponentially, right? That's what's happening to us. We are all growing this old super fast in comparison to the way that things used to be and to the way that things will be once more. All right, so we go back to Beetlejuice. So Lydia's like, oh my God, I need to ask for Beetlejuice to help me out. He's like, yeah, sure, I can help him, uh, but you got to help me. See, in order to do that, I got to get married. <laughs> you know, and she's like, all right, fine, whatever. Beetlejuice, 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 boom. And he goes, I like actually what he does is he sort of like fixes his like cuffs on his arms real quick. Just chill, just casual. It's showtime, right? 
So he leaves his microcosm. He pops up out of the middle of that um, that model or whatever. And there's like an umbrella that's about to come up and it's attached to Beetlejuice's head. And at the top of that umbrella, if you look close, you can actually see one of the initial forms for Jack Skellington, for Tim Burton's uh, Jack Skellington, for like uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas and stuff. So that's actually at the top of this umbrella, which is pretty cool. Now, all of, all of Delia's um, clay models or whatever, they all start coming to life, right? Um, because what you're about to watch, Beetlejuice has to get married. So there's some marriage symbolism. But on top of it, uh, Barbara and Adam are both back in their wedding outfits in the brides and uh, the groom and the bride's uh, clothing or whatever. That's because this is the cosmic wedding that we're about to watch. This is the event that that is uh, the marriage between the, the sky god and the earth goddess, basically. So that's also whenever things start coming to life and all that energy comes into our world. Not only does it bring back the dead, not only do the dead regenerate and come back to life, but those things that seem to be inanimate now all of a sudden are animated because they're filled with life. They're filled with spirit. They're filled with electricity and stuff. All right. So then we've got Beetlejuice. Look at him. He's wearing his little purple, I'm going to get married kind of uh, outfit or whatever, real classy. And then uh, he, he put Lydia into another one, sort of a red marriage dress. This was super interesting because I actually, um, a couple Halloweens ago, I dressed up as Deadpool. So this is one of my own personal pictures of me. I went to a costume contest on Halloween and I met Lydia. <laughs> like she ran up to me and gave me a big old hug. That's me as Deadpool taking a selfie with Lydia. And um, also Beetlejuice was rocking out on the mic right there behind me. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on that. That was kind of a fun time. There's Beetlejuice in the background. There's, there was like, like a karaoke or something going on. I don't know. Oh, I also met Donnie Darko too. Or actually Frank, I should say. It's not Donnie Darko. So I also met Frank and we had a beer together, just chilling, me and Frank. It was a good time. That's what that reminded me of. <laughs> Thanks for a walk down my own memory lane there. All right, cool. So right before they're about to get married, Barbara comes in riding this phantazoid worm, riding this huge sandworm, crashes in through the house, just like in Dune. I haven't even seen the movie Dune, but I was able to see that there's some pieces that are connecting. I guess one of the characters in Dune, I could be wrong, but it seems that this is true, um, also jumps on top of a giant sandworm and rides it around. We will be able to ride certain phantazoids, certain types of gigantic otherworldly creatures um, if we need, you know, if we need their help to do work, that is, um, that's more difficult for smaller people like us to do, um, like elephants, right? That's one reason why I believe that elephants have survived. They should be, dis they should be, uh, considered gone, right? But the reason that they survived is because they were so kind because they were helpful. They were seen as a benefit to humanity instead of a, a detriment or instead of, um, not a detriment, but instead of, uh, you know, hindering us they helped us so they survived basically right so some phantazoids we develop certain relationships with where if they help us we help them they don't go extinct we don't hunt them down etc anyways this uh and the sandworm itself is also black and white which is this you know symbolism of going from one realm to another and at the end uh we got lydia who passes her grades or whatever she gets good grades in school so adam and barbara made a deal with her that they will make her float up into the air. So she starts floating up, up into the air, doing this little like cha-cha or whatever, right? And um, that's exactly what we looked at when we, at the beginning of this movie, when we looked up her name, it basically meant that she is uh, the firstborn of those who float, which is very interesting how they have that um, at the end of the movie and she floats up into the, into the house or whatever. And that's the end of the movie. That was a quick one, man. That went by way too fast. I fully enjoyed that. I love this. It's such a classic. So I'm going to keep it short and sweet and uh, be graceful. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I do this segment all the time. Go check out my playlist. If you like this, you'll probably like my other movie breakdowns. It's called Truth in Movies. And I've got a dedicated playlist of over, I don't know, we're coming up on like 90 or 100. Pretty close, I want to say, to 100 movies now. Maybe I'll do something special for the 100th episode. Well, anyways, until next time, I'm Jay Dreamers saying good vibes. And goodbye.
Welcome.